I'm going to present AE Host Day, which is a NSS PAM client daemon for a directory solution I presented four years ago in Edinburgh. And, uh, and actually it was a to-do item I also um, already mentioned back then. Um, yeah, it's me, I'm doing some stuff. <coughs> so what's IEDEA? I'm not going to, to give a full IEDEA talk, that's too long. Uh, but this is the overall architecture. Some admins um, accessing, mainly accessing some kind of Unix, Linux servers, you know. And uh, those Linux servers are, are retrieving the password and group maps via LDAP with TLS from IEDEA consumers. IEDEA itself is, is um, it's based on open LDAP. Mainly it's a specific open LDAP configuration with a bunch of um, command line tools and web apps around it. <coughs> and um, what's, what's important to know is that the main aim of IEDEA at this point here is really enforcing or, or really living the need to know principle. So the goal is, the overall goal is that those systems <coughs> only have access to the users and groups and Zudoers roles. Oh. Sorry. Um, and to the Zudoers roles which uh, they are supposed to see. To achieve this, each system, each integrated system has to authenticate itself to actually be authorized to see the data. So what I'm talking about is this little component today. I'm not talking about the rest. <coughs> so, but for some understanding, <coughs> I'm talking about this entity, this entity authenticating and then getting authorized to basically <coughs> so getting authorized to see those users and those groups and the author authorization works with set based ACLs <coughs> and the set based, set based ACLs work their way along those references and only if <coughs> the chain of references is complete, those groups and its members will be seen on the host. And um, this is done to avoid to have to configure anything on the host to, to, um, to li limit the visibility. So all the visibility is just, is, is, uh, the, the visibility limits are just defined by maintaining data in the directory. So, <coughs> so this host configuration here, we're talking about several thousands. This host configuration is deliber deliberately kept very simple. Those, those clients are kept stupid. <coughs> so up to now, um, the customers are using here NSS and PEM client demons like SSSD. Who knows SSSD, for example? Yeah, quite many of you. <coughs> and well, despite some problems in the past, it, it does its job. But if I don't have any configuration here, if I don't want to have any configuration here, what the client basically does is it authenticates and then it says, in a search request, give me all I can see. So, obviously, if you have many entries and you have to follow many chains, processing the ACLs burns a lot of CPU cycles. And uh, yeah, and this really struck me. <coughs> no, okay. And this really struck me because it's 
it's very slow. So one customer here has 15,000 systems integrated with such a, uh, such a directory, and they are burning a lot of CPU cycles. And uh, I want to be a responsible citizen in this world. So burning CPU cycles for nothing uh, consumes power for electrical power for nothing, and that's bad. <coughs> OK, just. Um, um, how many of you are, are familiar with NSS and PAM and stuff? Yeah, most of you. So I can, can uh, do that quickly. Um, basically, on each Linux system, you have a config uh, file named etcnsswitch.conf. And in this config file for each so-called NSS map, for example, the PASWD uh, or the group map, uh, there's, a, there's a line saying uh, which modules, which data sources should be queried to retrieve the map data. <clears throat> I'll show you. It's very simple. It looks like this. Here you can see it looks in the files first and uh, and if it did not found uh, an entry, it asked for another module. <coughs> and you probably saw something like SSS uh, written there for the NSS module of SSSD or LDAP for the, for the classic PAM LDAP stuff and, uh, and NSS LDAP stuff. So modules are just, <coughs> sorry, I have to. Sorry, I have to add, disable that. Oh, shit. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, for each for each line in the nswitch.conf, basically you you're referencing a name which is a shared library. Um, which retrieves a map in a system-specific way. <coughs> uh, it's very easy to test that with a get end, uh, with a get end command. And here's the map name. Uh, you, for, for example, you can you can uh, just say get end password username to get the uh, the password entry. <coughs> um, there are also some 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 stuff with enumeration, yes or no, and caching, and uh, I don't want to go into the details at that moment. For the user management, the relevant map names are PassVD and groups, and uh, a special map name called init groups. <coughs> so there's also uh, there are also the pluggable authentication modules. Basically, they are used for password-based authentication also an authorization step based on a session. And uh, uh, in this context here, <coughs> we are just using it for checking passwords. The, the configuration is usually done in the directory. Um, uh, for, and for each service, you, you configure which shared libraries get used uh, to, to check, for example, a password. Yeah? <coughs> We can look into this uh, detail later. There are various steps. Uh, depending on the application running on the system, uh, it will go through several steps for checking the password, checking an authorization, and uh, yeah. Let's delete this one. OK, bye bye. So um, when configuring, uh, th this, this stuff is actually pretty flexible. It allows you to, to for example, say, I'm going to uh, check for this service, I'm going to check password against this backend service, and for this service, I'm going to check uh, passwords like this, and you have a, the f a kind of a fallback chain, and uh, yeah, it's very flexible. Um, 
documentation is sometimes not that good, you know, so, so it's very easy to shoot yourself in the foot. There are very prominent cases where even Linux distribution in their default configuration uh, messed up with that, uh, allowing root access without password or something. <coughs> so uh, if you're working on, on stuff like this, uh, obviously you should keep root shells open if you're, edit, uh, if you're playing around with the stuff and um, to, have, to have still access to a system. <coughs> um, and if you are tweaking your PAM config, of course, you have to, to do kind of a pen testing, check the negative cases, things which should not work. <coughs> and uh, most obviously, if you have found a working configuration, use config management to consistently apply it to every system you have. And if you have thousands of systems, that's, that's clear anyway. So there's another tool widely used um, called Zudo. <coughs> uh, some people like it, some people hate it. Uh, I also have mixed feelings about it because it's very complex code with lots of, um, lots of security issues in the past, also in the recent past. <coughs> But it's quite flexible because it allows you de to define uh, this mem uh, members of a certain group can uh, run a certain set of commands in a privileged fashion. Yeah? So it's very flexible. Uh, also, you can shoot yourself in the fo uh, foot very easily with that. Um, uh, bear in mind, keep your sudoers uh, config easy, uh, uh, really um, really short and very simple. <coughs> and, um, and there's an LDAP schema defining, uh, uh, enabling directories to store these sudo as entries. So in the default you have file in the file system, but you can also retrieve the sudo as data remotely and uh, store it in the LDAP server and retrieve it remotely. <coughs> Um, traditionally, this has been done with sudo LDAP, but which means um, that the sudo LDAP opens a new LDAP connection each time it asks, uh, it, it tries <coughs> to check the sudo's rules, <coughs> um, which is pretty bad because one of my customers, he has 2,500 servers running a monitoring check with a sudo command in there, and all those <laughs> Two thousand, two and a half thousand servers doing LDAP connections uh, synchronously. This was a kind of a DOS attack, <laughs> self self made DOS attack. <coughs> so this is not really something you want to do if you have many systems. Um, so there's another solution. For example, in SSSD, it retrieves sudo as rules and stores it in a local cache. <coughs> So, okay, why I host it? Uh, as I already said, um, it burns CPU cycles because uh, stupid clients just re want to retrieve everything and the database view based on the ACLs has to be calculated on the fly each time a, a client comes and queries. <coughs> Uh, the, uh, the, the, the first customer, they used also sudo LDAP, so um, this was uh, causing lots of TNS connections, very slow. <coughs> and um, espe also, especially um, if you have many clients and you, for example, restart your replicas, uh, you cannot predict if those stupid clients will come again to your replica. So um, Aedia is usually deliber deliberately used without the load balance in front because um, if you have to log to these systems as an admin, there's usually something wrong. So you don't, wa uh, so, so you don't want to have ma too many moving parts, you know? So, <coughs> so what I wanted to have is a client-side load balancing, but something which is rather predictable, so that I can really say, okay, 
clients are spreading the load, but they come back to a replica, for example, if I restarted the replica. <coughs> and, um, and those clients, they all have to, to use individual authentication credentials, which means each client has to have a password. It's similar to what each Windows workstation in an Active Directory domain has. You know, you have to, go to do an enrollment. Yeah? You have to g give the system a host password. And, um, and this step is usually done. Somebody is logging into this machine with, with uh, administrative credentials you know, to join the machine to the, to the Active Directory domain. And that's hard to automate. You know, so, so I want to also implement a solution, help, help with automated uh, deployment. <coughs> and uh, what I al also wanted to have is um, client-side support for LDAP over, uh, over IPC, LDAP over Unix domain socket, because the Aedia servers are integrated with themselves. <coughs> and so I want those servers to ask themselves for authorization, of course. And uh, finally, I was really f fed up uh, by asking other developers for features. Um, I had one feature added to a bug tracker, and the only thing which changed over the years was the milestone <laughs> in this ticket. So yeah, I'll show that feature later. <coughs> OK. So better performance, better behavior for lots of NSS clients, um, especially also besides the client side load balancing also have kind of a randomized behavior, a randomized uh, query behavior. So that even if you, ha if you are logging to 50 systems with cluster SSH or a similar tool, restarting all the demons, uh, they, will, they will spread the behavior, the, the, the search um, uh, they, they will desynchronize the, the search uh, timing. <coughs> so, and, uh, and the enrollment I wanted to just do via a simple SSH login, a pseudo SSH login. <coughs> and um, if, you, if you worked with SSSD or something, the man pages are, the, the docs are quite good. But you then see, oh, you can configure huge, a huge mess of options, and you can mess it up. <laughs> um, so I wanted to have less configuration and really small code, <coughs> and less dependencies. OK, how does it look like? <coughs> That's a typical Linux system. In this system, the SSH daemon uh, wants to query NSS maps, possibility maps, and group maps, and um, and it can uh, it uses a shared library, uh, a C shared library, um, and this C shared library uh, accesses the AE host A over a Unix domain socket, and similar for checking passwords, for example, it uh, uses a shared library for the PAM interface, which also uh, queries the AE host day over Unix domain socket. And the AE host day uh, speaks LDAP over TLS um, to, to the open LDAP server and queries data and sends bind requests for checking user passwords. <coughs> um, the AE host day also exports, exports sudo's files um, and converts them to local files. So it does, it does not have a special uh, shared library for Zudoors access, it, it uh, just exports files, very, very low tech. Yeah. <coughs> and it also, uh, it also updates SSH authorized keys for the users in the file system. <coughs> so th those are the, the three tasks. NSS maps, PEM-based password authentication, SSH authorized key synchronization, and sudo's files synchronization. That, those are the four tasks. <coughs> OK, it's written in Python. Uh, 
oh, Python is slow, everybody is saying. <laughs> everybody is scared, oh, Python is slow. Uh, it's fast enough, we will see later. <laughs> Following up on your uh, uh, question last time. Um, the front-end modules are actually the front-end modules uh, by NSS Pem LWD uh, of Arda de Jong. Uh, he was very friendly to have a configure option, the build time uh, configure option, uh, so you can spec specify uh, uh, your own custom name for the modules. So uh, usually I compile them to prevent any um, I pr compile them with the custom names to prevent any conflicts with PAM LDAP, NSS LDAP or something. <coughs> and uh, yeah, and uh, there's another daemon running there. Uh, ah, okay. Um, one, of the one of the reasons I wrote this is that the, the other implementations, uh, SSD for example, most times runs as root and I don't, uh, don't, don't want that. I don't want to have a Network daemon, even if it's a client, uh, to run as root. Yeah? So, so I divided uh, the stuff into a daemon which really accesses the LDAP server and an additional daemon running as root to place the, the uh, sudo's files in the local file system. <coughs> um, I'm doing full map enumeration. Uh, it's, it's it's kept very simple. It's, uh, it just has a refresh thread waking up uh, in, in certain intervals. And it just says, give me all I can see. <clears throat> but it can do it a little bit smarter because this client, of course, and that's why it's more efficient, this client knows, those, uh, the, knows the data. So it follows the reference it itself. Uh, I go back to this picture. So, mainly this client authenticates with a password and then it's allowed to read hit its own service group entries and then it uses the DREF search control to retrieve in one search uh, request the sudoers rules and the groups. And in another search request, based on the groups which are defined as visible, it can do a member of search for the, for the um, group members. <coughs> and this is way more efficient than just saying, okay, gi give me everything I can see. So less ACLs are triggered uh, by this smarter search. Okay. Um, Converting the, the sudo LDAP data into a local uh, into a local sudoers files requires that you have a recent sudo version, which has a new tool, zbt sudoers for converting several data formats of um, of sudoers data. <coughs> so there are more specific. There are more specific features. Uh, in Aedia, in the default configuration, each user entry has its own individual primary GID. And, uh, but without having really a group entry for this primary GID. So um, this is not really a problem, but locally this GID, this primary GID of the user is not resolvable. So if, if you have a stupid application running on the system which tries to, to really query the group map for the primary uh, users, the primary GID of the user, <coughs> it will find nothing. So and there are stupid applications which just crash because of this or something. You know? So <coughs> you never know. And therefore I'm introducing, I'm, I'm generating virtual group map entries for those primary GIDs. And additionally, I'm, uh, I'm creating virtual uh, role groups. Yeah? Uh, role is a little bit overloaded. It's a little bit, uh, normally I try to avoid this word. <laughs> but um, 
basically I'm, I'm creating virtual group map entries for permissions groups. We have to go back to this picture. You see here, there's one attribute saying all referenced group entries are visible, but, there's, uh, but there are other um, references. For example, this reference saying all the reference group members uh, have login rights. And there's another interesting group like all the referenced members have set up rights on this service group. And those role permissions I transform into a virtual group map entry. <coughs> So, and uh, okay, I already mentioned syncing of SSH authorized keys. And um, another special feature um, is that I'm sending the LDAP session tracking control. Who knows that control? <coughs> Only a few of you. And this control is very interesting because uh, I think the draft was, was written by Mark Wahl, if I remember correctly. And um, <coughs> And this is interesting. Originally, it was um, defined for radio servers. And because it's interesting that a an LDAP client can say, I add to my search requests or to my bind request additional information about what caused this request to be sent to the LDAP server. And I'm using this, for example, if somebody is do doing sudo and the password check is sent to the directory, I'm, uh, I'm using this to send the IP address of the client, of the SSH client, even to the, to the OpenLDAP server, which is friendly enough to put it into the normal log. <clears throat> and I also can send a session ID. So this is to improve, this is, uh, this is a very small detail to improve your audit logs. Yeah? <clears throat> That's great. I mean, if a system, of course, if a system is really hijacked, you know, you have to, you cannot trust those logs fully. But there's one edge where the, where the attack, attack began and was successful, and you have to find this edge, edge you know. So, so after this, the IP address is locked, might be, uh, might be false. <laughs> But, uh, but you have more information in your audit log. <clears throat> um, also, I'm implementing the, the hosts map, um, which is quite, uh, quite useful. Uh, for example, if your DNS goes down, you can, you can provide the host to IP address mappings uh, based also on data stored in IEDIA. <clears throat> yeah, and uh, finally, the enrollment is done with a pseudo SSH login just to a generic <laughs> user name. <clears throat> okay, that's how the enrollment looks like. Basically, an admin sets the host password in the directory. That's the first step. And then he does this pseudo logon, and the password is checked. It goes through the PEM stack to IA hosty. It sends a bind request, and then it says, oh, this is my host password. So if my host password is correct, because I checked it here, I can store it here in a, in a simple password file. Why I'm doing this? First of all, it's it can be automated very easily. You can write an Ansible module for that or something, you know, which does, uh, does the, these two steps and the rest just happens. So you can, so you can have a deployment where the, where the machine starts up with a running AE hosty, but the AE hosty still does not, is not able to access the directory because it does not have a password yet. So you don't have to inject the 
the, the host password into in, in, the, in the deployment process. It just comes up the machine. Nobody can really log in. But if you're doing this init step, after that, the security policy stored in the directory is immediately applied to that system. So compared to other de deployment processes, I should have, <laughs> I should have um, added a picture for the tr of the traditional process. The traditional process is a machine comes up, there's some magic credential allowed to log in there, and then you log in there, and then you log in, uh, and then you do some magic, for example, in Active Directory with a privileged account allowed to set the computer password. So the, a credential of a privileged account is going through this machine where it never belongs. So, uh, so, so for the security, there are two important points. First of all, you don't need any generic credential to, to initialize the system. You have to be the setup admin allowed to, to uh, set the host's password. But then you can simply use it here in the pseudo login. This avoids that a machine comes up with an undefined security policy. <coughs> and second, you don't have to use any admin credentials on the system to initialize it. Yeah? So if you, if you see any security problems with this approach, please let me know. <clears throat> okay, um, how much time is left? Oh, close, okay. A um, little bit about the configuration. Um, other implementations, they have exactly one parameter for defining a, a set of LW URLs to, um, to access the di uh, various directory replicas. And, but I needed two different. And one is URI list, which is really an ordered list. And it says, try to write these replicas in exactly this order. And the other one is URI pool. And URI pool is an unordered list, which gets sorted. And this sorted list gets rotated by a host specific hash Modulo the, the, modulo the number of replicas configured. <clears throat> and then I will have a host specific ordered list of replicas to try. So, so the URI pool, this, this uh, sorting the list, rotating it, is, um, is done for ensuring that the load is really spread across the configured replicas. <clears throat> and the first one is that I can really define, oh, but besides whatever is written in URI pool, please try URI list first anyway. Yeah? <clears throat> so, and this is pretty flexible. It's simple, but, but it's pretty flexible. <clears throat> and on the IADA server itself, this is just used for saying, oh, over an LDAP, uh, over an Unix domain socket, asks <coughs> the, the, local, the local open LDAP server, and if it doesn't work, then go to whatever replica is available. Um, yeah, and of course, I mean, you want to have config management, so there's an Ansible role configuring all this, the AE host configuration, and the NSS, uh, uh, NS switch conf, and the PEM configuration stuff, so. <clears throat> I already presented it in a lightning talk during Open LDAP Developers Day last year, and Nadja asked me, <laughs> so that's for you, Nadja, uh, Nadia asked me, oh, how about the performance? If I have a Zamba server with thousands of users, and, uh, and how fast is it? And so I did some tests, uh, creating thousands of home directories in a very tiny VM. Tiny VM means, means running on one core, 120 megabytes RAM. And, um, and actually, it turned out that this approach answers 3,000 varies per second with a LS, you know? And the theoretical limit can be reached uh, by using, by adding NSCD 
the name service caching daemon to the, to the game. So 7,000 is the theoretical limit anyway on this system. So, so I stopped optimizing. I have some more ideas <laughs> if really needed, but, but I thought, OK, anybody querying so many, many data uh, has, has more interesting performance problems to solve. <laughs> So, so if, if it would be a Samba server, Samba has more interesting performance problems. Yeah? <clears throat> okay, but what was really important also is how does that behave compared to what the customer is running up to now, uh, extrapolated to 15,000 machines doing a full refresh every five minutes. And the savings are quite significant, how I think, you know, especially if you run in the, in the cloud, for example, not in your private network and not on, on your private CPUs on promise. If you're running in the cloud, you have to pay all this. Yeah, so, and the savings is, with this number, the saving is over 200 gigabytes LAN traffic per day. Yeah, and you save more than 10 gigabyte log traffic. Uh, open LDAP block traffic per day. And that's quite significant, I think. Yeah? So, yeah, I like it. So, um, yeah, it, performance is sufficient, I think, at, at, for now. And um, the resource usage is really dramatically lowered. Uh, I, did, I don't have exact numbers for the, for the CPU, but um, on my small VM, the fan is going several seconds if I, if I use SSD for querying thousands of entries or, or filtering from thousands of entries. And uh, with AE Jose, it's just a few milliseconds. <coughs> and, um, and it seems to be quite stable. I'm using it in my own environment. Um, and it never fails. Um, yeah, an additional warning. PEM is scary. Uh, don't screw it up. Uh, have, have other people reviewing your stuff, definitely. Um, what I also like with this approach is that, I, that I'm now free to implement any features like the session tracking control or something. And, uh, but, um, I held myself back uh, to suffer from featuretes um, because, uh, well, it's very easy if you're, if you're working on that, oh, ah, this idea would also be nice and so, but um, yeah, but, but uh, I, I want only to, to implement features which are, uh, really have a use case. <coughs> okay, um, yeah, uh, a customer is funding the Python 3 migration, uh, that's nice. And um, for rolling it out in different deployments, uh, it would be nice if there are salt and puppet modules for it. <coughs> but it's simple. Okay, let's have a demo. Just for the enrollment. So uh, let's go back to this picture. I'm now doing this first step. I just set a new host password. <coughs> uh, the host actually, the host actually is readily configured. You know, you have here Aedia as a shared library module name, <coughs> and for example, you have here in the PEM configuration. Also. The PEM AEDIA, that's basically the PEM LDAP module of NSS PEM LDAP D, you know, so it's, uh, it just has a di different name. Um, it's added here, and <coughs> yeah. But the system <coughs> still does not have any AEDIA user entries except this little built in thing. And that's the, that's the important part. That's, that's a magic user used for the enrollment. Okay, let's look, look at that. So basically what we're doing, as we cannot log in at, as, at this, as this user. So 
So now, now we're doing the first step, setting a new password, random password for that host. That's this one. And I'm just copying this here in the password prompt. That was just a new, pa uh, new host password. And of course, I don't, of course, I don't get a real login session. That, that might, makes no sense. But internally, I stop that. So, but internally, it has now set its local host password, stored it into a file, and retrieved the the, the users and groups maps, the passity in group maps, uh, as you can see here. Yeah, okay, there, there are quite some users. It locks everything which gets changed, yeah? so you have good audit logs. So, get and pass it in, now lists all those IDEA users, and, and now I can log in as this user. It asks for my authorized key, uh, besides, um, just as a side note, Ah, no, I closed. No, okay. Um, just as a side note, uh, authorized keys can be limited to IP uh, addresses um, in the IDEA data, and this uh, gets added to the authorized keys file. So, and now I can uh, get a root shell. Or not. Okay. Maybe it's a different password. Okay, I forgot the password. Let's reset it. <coughs> oh, I have to check something. Okay, no OTP assigned. Okay, so let's set the password. Um, Okay. Uh, the burden of uh, secure default configurations. <laughs> okay, I can now use this password, and now I'm root. Yeah. And um, and here you can also see those virtual groups. This user has login rights. This user has the right to to view log files, and it's also a setup admin. Yeah, those are just virtual groups, not not retrieved from the directory. Um, another thing to show. <coughs> Where is it? So that's it here. You see this line. Um, in those in those brackets, that's the information sent by the PEM part. That's the that's the information stored in the session tracking control, which is sent along with the with uh, with the bind request for checking the, the user's password. Yeah. And it's quite handy because uh, you see it originates from the the username is not the username is really the username from the PEM session from the PEM stack retrieved from the PEM stack, and uh, and here you see it's coming from ah, there should be an IP address in there. Okay, there's no IP address in there. Um, if, if the application initializes the PEM, PEM call with the remote address, the R adri, uh, attribute, then the IP address of the SSH client would appear here. Yeah? So for whatever reason, the, those, 
this SSH daemon does not do it. Uh, sorry. Yeah, but. Uh, hmm? uh, no, this is um, this is the host name where, where it runs on. That's not the remote address. The remote address would be uh, my my laptop host. Yeah, so that's that's not the right one. Okay, that's it. Any questions? What changes Michael had to be made on the OpenLDAP side in order to support this? Obviously, you have a, a schema that has to be applied. There's probably Apple's. Uh, Okay, uh, basically, our idea is just a specific OpenLDAP configuration. And, but for the client, our idea just behaves like a stand standard OpenLDAP server. There's, they don't see any specific schema or something. The schema is just um, used for, the, the extended schema is just used for maintaining the system, to have metadata to maintain the system, but not for local stuff, you know? so so. The clients only see the usual group and user data, yeah? so really based on standard object classes. Yeah? And uh, and for running this client, I did not do any modifications in our idea. Yeah. So you talked about the uh, uh, the initial the initial setup for uh, for ours. How much data do you, what kind of stuff do you have to yeah, have ready in the directory before you set up the host? Do you have to provision it? Mm -hmm. the, the first time you're connecting to it, it definitely has an SHP or No, 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 no. The public keyboard is the keyboard is You need to know that you're actually. Ah, okay. Um, okay. No, okay. I get it now better. I mean, uh, this config. Mm, basically, it's. Okay, bum, bum, bum. Uh, basically it's the, the list of LDAP replicas to try. This is the first one. And the second is, um, and the second is the root CA, the trusted root CA certificate to do proper TLS server certificate verification. And, uh, and it has to know its bind DN, but in a short form, which means this is this is the system's canonical host name. That's it. Sure, but the directory needs to know. Or the directory needs to know something about the host. Yeah, of course. Like the, like mm -hmm. the public key. Otherwise, you could be logging into a rogue server and leaving them the servers. Uh, no, no public key at that. No, no public key. Well, are you still are you still connecting over SSH? Cool. Ah, yeah, okay. Uh, okay. If you if you want to sell. If you want to solve the known host problem for the SSH uh, connection, yeah. that's a that's a different problem. That's that's not part of this. Yeah. yeah? So, so where do you where do you set that, or do you just trust it on the first use and trust it with the password? Maybe? That's the usual. That's the usual game. I mean, you know, I, I've added here EKCA, and it's about open SSH certificates, and uh, those. Uh, I will try to talk about user certificates, but uh, you can also have host certificates. So you could solve the known host problems with open SSH certificates. But but that's not part of our AE hosting. It's not the task of AE hosting. So you're not deploying it on the new host as part of the, of the setup? You just, uh, I'm just deploy the host. It, it gets a new host key. Whether you grab the public key, you could even store it to the IE host uh, entry. You know. So but, uh, but that's not a task of AE hosting. Okay. No. Sorry about that's that's a separate problem space. And for for the uh, host, for the LDAP pool, uh, why do you keep it? Why you sort it first and then rotate it instead of randomize it and then point it in a random place? Because, because I want to. It, if you have a consistent sort, then uh, if one of the servers drops out, no. then, uh, then the next one in the in, in the list gets double the load instead of if everyone has. A different sort of it. Uh, where did I have this? I have a 
I, I consider the, the fully qualified domain name of the yeah. system, the canonical host name, to be fairly random. No, what I mean is, so you, your URI your will get sorted, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, host one gets to one, two, three, whatever, and do a replica two falls out. Th this rotation, I, I mean, I sort the list, but this rotation is system specific. Sure. Because I want to, shuffle. because I want to, um, in the normal case, when all replicas go up, I want to be this list to be de deterministic, somewhat deterministic. Yeah. So the randomness is just de there. So you just turn that around? You, or you I, 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 I'm not shuffling it, I'm rotating it by, by, the, by the hash modulo number of replicas. Yeah, thank you also in some of the replicas in various scenarios, but I'll explain that. Okay, so so Natya gave me the sign, it's lunchtime. Yeah? So.